Picture yourself on another Virginia quad, equally beautiful, some 49 years ago, when a young man participating in his college commencement, like you graduates, was likely thinking more about his future prospects. Also like you, he too was a liberal arts major in English. And like many of you, I am sure he was excited and a bit anxious about his future, for you see he was already married and his first child was on the way. And he hadn't, as of yet, nailed down that all-important first post-graduation job, so the stakes were high. But as will happen for all of you, I am reasonably certain, his first job came calling. He went to work as a cub reporter for the Hartford Times in what he called the greatest blessing professionally that has ever come to me. He describes that first newsroom in Hartford long before data processing and computer terminals, let alone email and Twitter, as right out of the movies. Battered typewriters clattering away and a guy on the copy desk yelling copy across the room. That guy, Bill Shea, became an early mentor, one of many important influences on his career. And little did he know way back there in Hartford that his career in journalism would lead him to join forces with Jack Anderson, one of the late 20th century's most famous and successful investigative columnists, contributing to countless exposés, some even leading to the demise of cabinet officers and the conviction of a U.S. Attorney General. Nor did he know that he would become, for 11 years, ABC's Capitol Hill correspondent, followed by eight years as the network's chief White House correspondent, covering congressional leaders, presidents, and world leaders, and the most important news stories of his era. When Mr. Hume left his White House post, President Clinton said of him, quote, all of us think you have done an extraordinary professional job under Republican and Democratic administrations alike. And little did Mr. Hume know, way back in Hartford, that his career would then take another major turn, this time into the revolutionary new world of 24-hour cable news. He would join the then-fledgling Fox News Network in 1996 as its managing editor, launching Special Report with Britt Hume, which would quickly become one of cable's most popular and important news broadcasts. It was a great fit. Mr. Hume succeeded in being the ringmaster in a significant program decidedly not about him. And along the way, our speaker has earned prestigious awards, including the Saul Tayshoff Award for Excellence in Broadcast Journalism from the National Press Foundation. And he has been described as not being in it for the celebrity, but rather to explore the truth. He is a man characterized by hard work, great spiritual focus, and valuing, above all, a sense of fairness. It has indeed come a very long way from that beautiful lawn in Charlottesville. And so it is we welcome today with genuine enthusiasm and appreciation your 2014 commencement speaker, Mr. Britt Hume. being introduced and I don't think I've ever had a more glowing introduction than that one and it always worries me a little bit because I always am afraid that I won't be able to live up to the introduction in fact I remember uh, one talk I gave not too long ago the person who stood up delivered this, this glowing long introduction and I was sitting there thinking oh Lord I'm never gonna be able to manage to live up to this and as my apprehension grew I glanced at the program and it was a typographical error on my title. My title now is Senior Political Analyst at Fox News, but, but analyst had been spelled A-N-A-L-I-S-T. I thought, Senior Political Analyst, I might be able to measure up to that. <laughs> Thank you, President Lindgren. Thank you, Randolph-Macon University, for this singular honor you've bestowed upon me. I am 
delighted to be in the company of my fellow honorary degree recipients, and especially so to be with my old friend and, and much respected and beloved colleague, Brian Lamb. So thank you for having me here. I, I always try in these to say something of relevance to the graduates. And I was trying to, you know, I was nearly 50 years ago when I, as, as President Lindgren described, when I graduated, I, what, what do I have in common with these graduates? And I think I, I have one thing in common. I, they don't know, you don't know, what I'm going to say here, and in fact, neither do I. <laughs> I want to tell you about someone. Uh, when I was a correspondent in the Washington Bureau of ABC News back in the 1980s, a young woman came to us out of the University of Virginia where I went. I don't think I would know that she went there if we hadn't had that in common and talked about it. And she took an entry-level job in our bureau, and that meant that she did the lowliest jobs. She went out for coffee. She did Xeroxing. She answered the telephone. There's a lot of that in entry-level jobs. She, but she did all these jobs with uncommon cheer. She did them very well. She got them right. And she was on top of that cheerful. She was wonderful on the telephone. And everybody loved her. Her name was Katie Couric. And I mention that to illustrate a point I want to make to you graduates today. And that is that you're about to leave the world where you are where you are seniors, you're graduates, you're at the top of the school, and you're going to enter the work world, which is a very different place. Now you will find that success in America, at the time you'll find success in America is very democratic with a small d. It is open to nearly all. And while the education you receive here at Randolph-Macon will never leave you, the habits of thought, the things you learn will be with you always, no one can ever take them away from you. The fact that you went here as opposed to somewhere else and receive one degree as opposed to another will cease very quickly to matter. In fact, once you start the work world, it really won't matter very much at all because in the work world, you'll be working under people who are busy. And what they're looking for is someone who can help them. And you will be assigned in all likelihood, whether it's a new job or an internship, as many of you will go to internships, and this is a tough job market, and I understand that, you'll be assigned a lot of small jobs. And I heartily recommend to you that you do these small jobs, however tedious and boring they will be, as well as you possibly can. Because whatever the job is, however menial it may seem, it matters to someone above you that it be done properly. And if you do so, and do it cheerfully and well, it will be noticed. It will especially be noticed in such small things as your phone matters. Now, telephones, I know, are being used in ways different from the way they used to be. Landlines are going away, and everybody's carrying a phone in their pocket or their hip, and they're communicating as much by text as by voice. I understand that. But any new job in any office, you're going to be answering the telephone. When you do, you have a wonderful opportunity that you may not recognize to distinguish yourself from others, and that is by having terrific phone manners. Now, my father used to say to me when I was in my teenage years that he hated the way I answered the phone. He'd say, look, put a little music in your voice. I would answer the phone by saying, hello. Or some of you in your early jobs may be, depending on where you are, it might be, hello, Al's Body Shop. You can do better than that. Put a little music in your voice. Hello, good morning. Al's Body Shop, this is Steve. Al's Body Shop, this is Ella. Now, could, the reason why that's important is that it's, it, that it's cheerful and it makes a good impression, but you, the other thing is you don't know who's on the other end of the phone. And if, you, and if you respond well and with a cheerful greeting and are exceedingly polite to the person on the other end of the phone and you take a message if you must and you call that person by name, that person is going to be impressed with you because an awful lot of young people don't do that. So think about that. Small jobs, I should tell you, can lead to big jobs. That's a small job, but you never know where it might lead. In fact, I learned a hard lesson about phone matters back in my ABC News days. I was covering the transition from the Clinton administration to the Bush administration, which I'd covered, to the Clinton administration. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas. In those days, I, was cover I, co I had covered uh, President uh, Bush in his unsuccessful re-election bid, and my colleague, the famous, perhaps not to you graduates because this was a long time ago, but then very famous, very boisterous Sam Donaldson had covered uh, the Clinton campaign. I went over to pick up Clinton. Sam went back to Washington. And I was sitting in the workspace we were using in our affiliate station in, in Little Rock one day, and we had a telephone system set up for us, and somebody was answering the phone, and I got paged 
And I picked up the phone, Who's, and they said, you have a phone call. Who is it, I said. And the woman said, it's Charlton Heston. Now, some of you may not remember Charlton Heston, but he was an extremely famous and successful actor. And he played in huge movies, Ben-Hur, and other famous movies of that era. And I no more thought this was Charlton Heston than the man in the moon. I assumed it was Sam Donaldson calling. So I picked up the phone and I said, what the F do you want? And I didn't say F. <laughs> and the voice on the other end said, Mr. Hume, this is Chuck Heston. And I said, oh my God. Well, it turned out he was, uh, Charlton Heston was conservative and he was going to be on some, uh, he was chairing a panel at some conference that the political journal National Review was hosting and he, he wanted me to be on the panel. And I was stammeringly, by this time I was stammering, I oh, well, Mr. Heston, he said, Brett, he said, please call me Chuck. And I said, I could no more call you Chuck, sir, than I could call Moses Mo. <laughs> so I learned a hard lesson about phone manners. Believe it or not, they're important. And so are all the other little jobs that you will be assigned. So keep that in mind as you go. And the other thing I want to mention to you that I think is important is, when you're young, particularly in your 20s, Time goes by so slowly. And I, my, one of my granddaughters just turned 15, and I thought it was, a, you know, I, there's a picture of me holding her as an infant, and I thought it, it seemed to me like it was about three or four years ago. As you get older, time goes by more quickly, and the people you're working for are experiencing time more quickly in those early years than you will be. And there's a temptation sometimes to think the world is passing you by. If you're, you have a job and you've had it a while and you think you've learned all you can learn from it. And, and you'll, you'll think, oh, you know, I, I, I need to move on. And maybe you do. Very often when you work someplace for a while and you're doing a good job and the people you're working for are very happy with it, they may want to keep you in that job and you may not get the advancement you deserve. And sometimes you just have to pick up and go and move on to something else. That's fine. But be careful about it. Because time, goes, time will hang heavy on your hands. And there's a temptation to believe, oh, no, the world is passing me by. And there's a connected a bit of wisdom I have for you on that as well, which is this. There's an old saying that opportunity only knocks once. It's bunk. The same opportunity may only knock once, but in America, if you're working hard and trying hard, all kinds of opportunities will come, and it's very important that you choose the right ones. In fact, most people will look back over their careers who've been successful and tell you that some of the best decisions they made were the jobs they didn't take. So it's something to think about. If you decide, and it's hard to do this in the decade of your 20s, I, as President Lyndon described, was extremely lucky that when I started out, the first job I had turned out to be the business I've been in ever since. I've never really been anything but a reporter. But some of you won't be so fortunate. You will spend the time in the decade of your 20s trying to get your foot on the bottom rung of the right ladder. But once you do, what you want to think about in terms of advancement and work is trying to learn from the job you have. And if you've got still things to learn from the job you have, don't be in a great hurry to, to move on to the next job. Because you can look on a resume if you move around a lot like you're somebody who can't hold a job. Now that's not as true today as it might once have been because the fluidity in the job market is greater than it once have been. People move along more quickly. The whole pace of life in America has changed from what it once was. But it's something to keep in mind. Opportunity will knock many times in many different ways, not only once. So the question as you, as you sit here today about to receive this degree is, you know, what's it worth to have a college degree? And as I mentioned earlier, you know, the habits of thought, the things you've learned will stay with you always. Uh, where you went to college will cease to matter very quickly. But in terms of income, and this is where I want to say a special word of congratulations to the parents here. College is, college is expensive. Parents sacrifice for this. And the question arises, is it worth it? Well, there's new data out on that. Last year, college graduates, on average, in America, made 98% more money than non-graduates. Think about that. Over the course of, of a career, it has been calculated that a college graduate will earn, on average, $500,000 more than a non-graduate. When you look at it that way, college is a bargain. And another thing to think about as you depart here today, $500,000 is a lot of money. Hell, you're already rich. <laughs> Have a wonderful summer. <laughs>
Britt, thank you for those uh, timely and appropriate uh, remarks at this stage of our graduate's career. We have for you something to remember Randolph-Macon by. Thank you for being with us.